Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this launch of our new Sherlock Holmes titles. I'm Luciana O'Flaherty. I'm the editor of Oxford World's Classics, and we're planning to publish all nine volumes of Sherlock Holmes novels and his collected short stories over the next year or so. So please do look out for those. But tonight, we're very lucky to have with us our first four editors for Conan Doyle, including our general editor, Daryl Jones. And they're going to discuss the works in general, as well as give some insights into their own experiences of editing these volumes for Oxford World Classics. They will also answer some questions at the end. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A on the right of your screen, and we'll try to get to some of those. But before all that, please let me introduce them. Daryl Jones is Professor of Modern Literature and Culture at Trinity College, Dublin. He has edited many volumes for the Oxford World's Classic series, including the collected Ghost Stories of M.R. James and Arthur Conan Doyle's Gothic Tales. He has also published Horror, a very short introduction, and he is writing a biography of M.R. James. He is the editor of The Hound of the Baskervilles. Nicholas Daly is Professor of Modern English and American Literature at University College Dublin and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. His publications include The Demographic Imagination and the 19th Century City, Paris, London, New York, and Ruritania, A Cultural History. For Oxford World's Classics, he has edited The Scarlet Pimpernel and The Prisoner of Zender, and he is the editor of A Study in Scarlet. Jarlath Colleen is the head of the School of English at Trinity College Dublin and a lecturer in Victorian literature and culture. His most recent publication is Imagining the Irish Child, Discourses of Childhood in Irish Anglican Writing of the 17th and 18th centuries. He is the editor of the Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. And finally, Christopher Pittard is senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Portsmouth. He is the author of Purity and Contamination in the Late Victorian Detective Fiction and co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Sherlock Holmes. He is writing a book on literary illusions and he, is, he has edited The Return of Sherlock Holmes. So again, welcome to the panel and welcome to all of you. And let me hand over to Daryl for the discussion. Thank you, Luciana, and good evening, everybody. Um, so we have uh, four new editions of Sherlock Holmes. Um, uh, the first four in, in, in a set of nine, the collected uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and so I want to start um, uh, by um, asking my, 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 my colleagues and co-editors here, um, uh, why do we think the world needs new editions of Sherlock Holmes? Um, uh, and more generally, why, why do we think that Holmes is so enduringly, so continuingly popular, more than, you know, probably more than any other literary character? In fact, why do people want to continue to read, to discuss, to think about, and actually to adapt um, the, 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 the stories? So, 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 so Nick, in, in your introduction, one of the places that you go near the beginning is to give us a kind of, a kind of prehistory of the detective novel before, of the literary detective before Holmes. Um, why do you think um, the, the world latched onto Sherlock Holmes and not really to any of the others? Well, I suppose it's not entirely fair to, the, to say that they, they hadn't latched onto any of the others. Um, but in, in some ways, I think Conan Doyle does really make the better mousetrap. Um, he, he takes what, what, what he likes about his predecessors, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, say, or Wilkie Collins, and he sort of modernizes them, really. I mean, he, he, he takes the big sprawling um, mystery novel like Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, and he takes elements of the the, the, the short story as as, as poet developed it, and, and he and he comes up with this infinitely it seems repeatable um, format of um, there are homes and, and Watson at, at Baker Street mysteries come along they solve them um, so that there's there's a novelty but there's also continuity um, I, I think at at some level you know he he has invented. Um, something like a, a new superhero, um, more so than, than earlier detectives. Holmes actually is almost superhuman, really, in, in his abilities to, to to solve crimes, clear up mysteries, um, turn ash 
from a, a mute witness into into a speaking one um read mud um take the the, the material world and turn it into a, a a speaking witness uh for for his purposes and i also i wouldn't underestimate the the um the value of Watson in all of this. One, one of the things he'd also learned, I think, from his predecessors, in, including kind of less well-known pickers like Anna Catherine Green, the the, 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 the importance of a sidekick, um, uh, sort of a, a, a manuensis. Um, there's no point having um, all Jeeves and no Worcester. You, you, you actually need, need, need the two, really, for it to work, I think. But others will, will feel differently. <laughs> Well, uh, let, let's find out. I mean, Chris, Chris you, you also have a very deep background in, in, in the study of uh, both of, 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 of Conan Doyle and of Holmes, but also of Victorian detectives more generally. What's your sense then of, 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 of why, why we love Sherlock Holmes more than the others? Let's put it that way. Then. Yeah, I think there are two factors that Doyle gets especially right, actually, as compared to contemporaries like, for instance, Grant Allen or, or Catherine Perkis or L.T. Mead. And I think the first of these is the Holmesian method, uh, the fact that it seems to be such a logical process. And I think that appeals to readers. I think that still appeals to viewers and fans of Holmes today, the fact that Holmes is able to come up with these seemingly sort of magical conclusions. And then he'll take a step back and say, it was all of these, these little inferences, all of these little observations, and they all add up to a, to a bigger picture, which of course he's also adapting from Poe. We, you know, we see this in Murders in the Rue Morgue as well. Doyle very, you know, very consciously takes this technique from, from Dupin in, in the Poe stories. But he, he, he transforms it almost into a sort of a serial thing. You know, we wonder what what's going to be the deduction uh, this month, as it appears in the Strand magazine in the in the short stories. So I think that's the first thing that Doyle gets right. It's this idea that maybe you can do this. You can also try and be uh, Sherlock Holmes. You're never going to be as good as Sherlock Holmes because, as Nick said, you know, he's this hero, super heroic. Uh, figure. But there are readers of Holmes who attempt to do this, who will attempt to sort of read the world in those ways and, and come to the similar kind of conclusions. And I think the second thing that Doyle uh, gets right, or, or one of the reasons why Holmes is so successful, is that actually I think Doyle is underrated as a comic writer as well. There's something quite comedic about, uh, about the Holmes stories, and especially in uh, when he moves to the Strand magazine in 1891, having written the first two novels, and then when he starts The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, uh, that first set of 12 short stories, they're quite funny short stories. They're quite comic. Uh, they deal with these absurd situations. It doesn't know why, why is a red-headed man paid hundreds of pounds to copy out an encyclopedia? Um, how does a jewel end up in, in a goose? And, and so on. So there's this sort of comic... Uh, this comic writing that Doyle, I think, uh, pins down, which is not to say you know, you're reading the Sherlock Holmes stories and you're laughing along with them. They're not sort of comic in that way. But there's this very real sense in which I think Doyle grasps the absurdity of a lot of detective fiction as a form as well. The fact that it is actually quite artificial. Um, and he really plays with it. I think he really you know, um, establishes that. I'm thinking... Uh, for instance, in the Red-Headed League, where there's a reference to um, an address turning out to be a manufacturer of artificial kneecaps, uh, which is meant to be funny. I think most modern readers might see that as just Victorian weirdness, but Doyle is actually making a joke there. He's, he's really quite funny. So I think the wit, actually, of, of the home stories has a big part to play in, in why they, they, uh, they last so long. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you uh, about the uh, about the wit. Um, uh, th they are very funny, I think, very often. Um, Jelf, what, 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 what's your sense of this? What's your take on this? Uh, I think it comes at just the right moment for uh, readers who are looking f to uh, kind of uh, for a character who will help them re-enchant the world. I mean, he, he comes alive for readers in a way that very few other literary characters do. In uh, at a time when I think people were readers were feeling quite jaded in terms, you know, they, it, it, sociologists talk about the disenchantment of the world, the bureaucratization, the rationalization, the skepticism of uh, 19th century uh, professionalism. And here was this character who appeared to perform a kind of magic um, in his deductions um, and who was with them, you know, month after month, who lived with them to a certain extent and became quite real. For them, I do. I, I don't actually think it's the 
the puzzles themselves that are drawing people back because you know one of the best home stories is the final problem which has no puzzle whatsoever but uh, this is this is one of the one of the you know people's favorite stories uh, it, it's homes it's homes as a as a as a person someone who almost takes on a kind of real existence um i think the, the critic michael Saylor describes it as a kind of an as if mentality that the readers uh, adopt. He, he exists for, for readers in a way that their acquaintances, their relatives, their, the, those that surround them in their everyday life, he, they exi he exists in, in not in exactly the same way, but, but in an analogous way. Hence why they feel so in, you know, emotionally invested in him. And um, you know, in a way that they don't of you know, even very popular other detectives that, uh, that Chris mentioned. But e even if we take it in the 20th century, I, I don't think somebody like Hercule Poirot has the same kind of, um, you know, existential reality that uh, Holmes does. Um, okay. Part because it's such an investment, an emotional investment mm. in him. So since we're talking about Holmes um, as a character and, and Holmes as... As you know, so, so something that the, the readers treat as, as as something close to a human being. Um, as 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 editors here, you know, we we've 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 accompanied Holmes um, across a variety of stages of of what was actually quite a long career. So you know, Nikki, you're, you're there at the very beginning um, uh, uh, with, with with the study in Scarlet um, when when he's uh, you know when he when he's still called Jay Sharonford Holmes, um, and then 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 Jarlath, you, you've uh, with with the memoirs, you know, this is him at the at the, at the height of his at the absolute height of his success. Um, it, with um, uh, with Hound of the Baskervilles and myself, um, he's in this strange in between state. He's he's neither alive nor dead quite, and yet we're not quite sure where he is. And with with with, with Chris uh, in the return, he unambiguously returns from the dead. Um, so I guess my question is, do we? It, is he the same man throughout? Um, does he grow? Does he develop? So, so Nick, I'll start with you again. Since you're you're in on the ground floor, as it were, um, what what what's he like at the very beginning? Well, he's he, he definitely changes. I mean, I, I think um, I think we've all pointed to this in in, a, in our introductions. The extent to which the the homes you get uh, at different points is is a slightly different homes. Um, so in the eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties, I think. He's he's very much a sort of a, a fin de siècle um, detective. There's there's a, there's a touch of the decadent about him. Um, he's he's still very much an aesthete who who values crimes for their artistic nature rather than for their seriousness uh, or for you know the, the the scope for for some kind of intervention and 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 doing good fight, fighting evil uh, as as as, as Jarlath points out uh, in his introduction as, as you see in the later stories at, at this point you know he's he's looking for a study in scarlet uh, sort of a, a beautiful pattern that he that he can discern in the carpet uh, as 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 it were um and he's 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 not famous. He's he's still um, overshadowed by the police. Uh, they they steal his his glory, um, valor, as we say now. Um, and he is not particularly well off. He he, he the reason he, he ends up sharing rooms with with Watson is is because London is expensive and and he needs to um, sh share the rent. Um, he he's not the international uh, star that that he that he becomes later. Um, but he, he is on the way as as. Um, as, as Chris was saying, he, he has that that ratiocinative method that, that that's partly borrowed from um, from Edgar Allan Poe and maybe a little bit, little bit from uh, Emile Gaborio as well. Um, so that that's already in place. But I think a lot of the other factors uh, are, are are not the the cocaine taking doesn't appear till till later. Uh, and I think you know, as 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 uh, as other editors have pointed out, besides ourselves, he, he becomes more patriotic as, as, as time goes by. Um, in 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 line, presumably, with you know, uh, re readers' interests in and around the, the lead up to, to World War One, um, among other things. Yeah, I mean, I think he also becomes uh, um, uh, rather less obnoxious as time goes on. The thing that struck me reading *Study in Scarlet* again is he's 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 quite he's something of a maniac. You know, he violates corpses. He does it, it, not the roommate for everyone, really. I think um, he would be quite quite a difficult um, roommate. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, how is he when you encounter him, Jonathan? Well, he's still quite a difficult roommate because uh, uh, one of the stories opens with him, you know, shooting. 
uh, into into the wall uh, to celebrate uh, Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, and and you know the the wall starts to crumble. You know, so he's quite a difficult roommate. But one of the so he continues in that vein. But one of the things that struck me was that. Whereas in, in studying Scarlet, you know, Watson starts off with uh, providing a list of things that he doesn't know that, you know, knowledge of astronomy, nil, knowledge of philosophy, nil, knowledge of literature, nil. Um, but in, in the, the memoirs, he's able to talk about anything. There's a, there's a, a discussion where uh, Watson says, you know, they, they start to talk about golf clubs, they move on to hereditary delusions, and they then they go on to the obliquity of the eclip ecliptic. That's that suggests that he somehow developed knowledge of um, astronomy in the in the gaps between uh, the, the 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 text. So uh, my sense is that he's becoming through through memoirs, he's becoming much more knowledgeable, almost omniscient, so that he he's kind of absorbing all knowledge. And by the end of the the the, the collection, he's he's he is almost superhuman in that he's also omniscient as well as omnipresent and om, om, uh, omnipotent almost. So I think that there is something quite startling about the change actually from, from the beginning to certainly before he before he dies. Yeah, and 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 die he does, but 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 you know, as as Conan Doyle knew um, better than anyone from his um, spiritualist beliefs, death death is never the end, and it certainly wasn't the end um, 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 for Holmes. So so Chris, when 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 he rises from the dead, is he the same man? No, he he sort of changes again. He moves into almost sort of opposite opposite directions. So. On the one hand, he becomes this almost this mythic figure. And I think when he comes back, there's this weird sort of self-awareness around the stories as well. The fact, partially because Doyle now, well, Doyle always knew he was writing for the market, but now he knows there's a, there's a whole mass of, of Holmes fans who want Holmes back. So you get these odd sort of reflective moments in the return, especially in the opening story, The Empty House, where one of the, the most famous illustrations, one of the most famous scenes, is Holmes looking, he's in the house opposite uh, 221B Baker Street, looking through the window at a bust of himself, and the bust is a sort of a decoy to draw an assassin's bullet, but it's an odd reflective moment where Holmes is kind of reflecting on himself as this famous figure. So on the one hand, he becomes this you know, even more mythologized uh, figure. But on the other hand, there's also a sense when he comes back, he also becomes more more embodied. You know, in Hand of the Baskervilles, as you said, Daryl, he's this slightly spectral figure. He's not alive, but not dead at the same time. He's, he's sort of ghostly in Hand of the Baskervilles. In the return, he's fully embodied, but also a bit more... Uh, almost sort of down to earth in a very real, in a very real sense. There's very much a sense in the return of Sherlock Holmes, he's taking on a slightly more paternalistic attitude as well. I think we see a greater sense in which he is teaching Watson, the way in which he's teaching uh, a figure like the policeman um, Stanley Hopkins, who in many ways in those stories takes on the Watson role of not really knowing what's going on and having to have things uh, explained to him. Um, Holmes says he's going to write a chronological textbook uh, at one point. Earlier, he'd written you know, monographs on various different types of ash for his own intellectual interest. And now suddenly he's thinking about training others. So he comes back from the dead aware of his own legend, aware of his own myth, but also, I think, with a sense of wanting to pass that on, wanting to, uh, to teach others. And I think what's also interesting about his his return in in the return as well, is that in that in that block of stories we see relatively few displays of deduction. Actually, he seems to have moved away from that figure in a study in Scarlet, in the Sign of Four, in the Adventures. Actually, reviewers at the time said, you know, where are these deductive chains of reasoning that we love so much? And actually, I think it's in Return we begin to see even more the emergence of that Holmes as a, as a man of action. As as sort of as we said, you know, he becomes more patriotic. Um, I think we see in in something like the Return of Sherlock Holmes what he then go on to become in a story like His Last Bow, where he's absolutely uh, the sort of the, the defender uh, of England. So yeah, he he changes yeah. quite significantly actually once he's once he's back from the back from the dead. Yeah. Um, as, as as textual editors, uh, you know, uh, I think our relationship with 
the works that we edit uh, can often be very intimate ones. We, we, we get closer to our text than, than probably than any other kind of reader or critic. So I, I want to I ask if we can if we have some thoughts on this, some ideas on this. What did we find in the process of editing? What did we discover that we didn't know before? For example, that we think is that we think is important, um, and I, I, I'll start us off uh, on this one. I mean, the thing that really strikes me now about um, uh, the Hand of the Baskervilles that, that I I hadn't realised, or certainly not realised so much before, is to do with uh, um, uh, the history of the composition of the book and how that actually affects what we read. You know, the, 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 the Conan Doyle doesn't start out writing a Sherlock Holmes story at all. He starts out writing a gothic tale set on Dartmoor, which, you know, has about the, the legend of a phantom hound. And then, um, because he's a literary professional and uh, they offered him a huge amount of money, um, uh, here comes Holmes. And, and so the, 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 the Holmes story is sort of, is sort of inter, or, or overlaid onto this foundation of a gothic text. And you can really see the joins. And this is one of the things that's so, so fascinating about, uh, about Baskervilles. You know, Holmes is absent uh, for, for, for the, the, the whole middle section of the novel. He's, he's not there at all. And the, 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 that, that kind of tension and undecidability between, you know, the, um, uh, the rational material world that Holmes embodies in London on the one hand and the, uh, the, the occult and supernatural world, um, the world of folklore, the world of Dartmoor on the other. Um, I think that that, 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 that really comes uh, uh, into, into focus once we understand how the novel actually came into being uh, 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 as it was being written. Um, so so that, that's kind of what I, what I learned. Chris, what about you? I think what I found most interesting about uh, editing the return is is actually a point about publication history. So so not so much what's actually in the text, but rather the various ways in which it's been it's been presented, and especially the transatlantic publication history of the stories as well. Because of course we tend to think of Holmes as you know a British figure. We tend to think of him as being and Doyle as being very closely associated with the Strand magazine. And of course, that is a slightly different story with the return of Sherlock Holmes, because actually Doyle had originally contracted those stories to an American publication, uh, to Collier's Weekly. So most of those stories first appear in the US and then only come to, uh, to UK readers um, of afterwards. I mean, the delay in most cases is only about a month or so, but there's a sense in which you know, he's an American, these are American stories first, and then British stories uh, second. And actually, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of play made about that uh, at the at the time. So when I was editing, actually, The Return, I, I was looking at these two separate texts. So the, the text published in Collier's Weekly in the US, and then the text is published in the Strand Magazine in, in Britain. And the Strand Magazine text is the one I've used for this edition because I think it, it flows slightly better. But actually, what I found in comparing those is the the differences actually between the two versions as well and i don't mean i mean in terms of the words doyle is writing they're they're quite similar there are some changes uh, between the two but even basic things like the punctuation that the various magazines are using um collier's magazine is quite haphazard in its use of commas for instance um this is we spraying them all over the place but i was finding when reading these texts that actually it's as if the stories are unfolding at a different speed. They have a different pace uh, to them. And to take a sort of a visual metaphor, it's like watching something recorded on video and something recorded on film. It's the same image, but, but there's a different feel to it. There's a very different uh, sense of it. Likewise, the fact that some of, the, uh, some of the questions Watson asks in the Strand magazine will have question marks. So in the primary school, for instance, he said, you know, put the bicycle. Holmes with a question mark, which makes it sound like a sort of, you know, a question inviting Holmes to say more. In Collier's magazine, it's an exclamation mark, which makes it sound much angrier, actually. But Holmes, you haven't followed a, you haven't followed a bicycle. Your, your chain of reasoning is, is ludicrous. So those minor changes cumulatively build up. And I think for readers in, in America in 1903, 1904, they are reading something which feels very different. It's, it's Doyle's same words, but the way in which it's been edited, I've been made much more aware, actually, of that kind of editorial process in, in the distinction between uh, the Strand British copy and the Collier's uh, yeah. American copy. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, I was really aware of sort of you know publication histories actually in, mm. in my works. So. Yeah. And what about you, Jeff? Well, one of the interesting questions uh, that for the for anyone editing the memoirs is why the cardboard box performs a kind of disappearance trick. So the cardboard box um, appears after. Uh, Silver Blades in the Strand, um, and is it does appear in the first American edition of Memoirs, um, but doesn't appear in the first British um, edition. And so one of the questions that all editors of Memoirs have asked, you know, why? What is what is the issue here? Why does he suppress it? Um, apparently, he had a conversation in the early twentieth century with a friend where he claimed that it was such a scandalous story, and he was afraid that his adolescent readers would be horrified by it and might be corrupted by it. But you know, the, the rest of the stories contain plenty of scandalous activities. Um, and this is a story in which, you know, a, a, some severed ears are sent in a, in a cardboard box um, and that it starts a chain uh, of investigation where, where we find a, a double murder. A man has killed his, his wife and her lover. Um, what, what I kind of concluded was that the, this story push Holmes to to the kind of edge of rationalism. Is is there any way to account for the apparently arbitrary and superfluous nature of the violence that he that he's encountered in the story? And, and he, the, the story ends in quite a despairing note for this arch, apparently arch rationalist. He he asks in in, the, in sort of the final paragraph, um, what is the meaning of it? What object is served by this circle of misery and violence and fear? To what end? There is the great standing perennial problem to which human reason is as far from answer as ever. And I think that this actually, there's an anxiety about the ration, about rationalism and reasoning all the way through memoirs. But this, the ending of this story put it so starkly that in fact it couldn't be contained within within a, a sort of a, a standard understanding of the of the detective story and and the standard understanding of. of 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 Holmes as a as a as someone who can penetrate the mysteries of the universe, um, so I think that's really what's behind the the reason of move, moving it, getting rid of it, because it just doesn't fit into the worldview. Yeah. And um, and Nick. Yeah, there were there were two things that really struck me. I think when, when I was editing a uh, study in Scarlet. One, which I partly knew already, I suppose, but uh, to a limited extent, the way in which it, it really was not an overnight success. So, you know, it, famously, it, it, it appears in a, in a Christmas annual in 1887 rather than in a, a more glossy publication, uh, pretty, pretty, from a pretty much kind of, you know, middle of the road to kind of lower tier publisher, Wardlock. Um, and it, it, it doesn't quite sink without a trace, but it it, it does not glean very, very many um, reviews and and some of those aren't aren't entirely positive. Uh, so it, it, it really is only when it's reissued and then when um, uh, the, sign of the Sign of the Four comes out that um, it, it begins to sort of gather momentum. Uh, it, it takes a little while for the overnight success to, be, to become successful. Um, but the other thing that, that really struck me, uh, and, and this really was a revelation, was when I started, I mean, I, again, I, I had some sense that you know, obviously no writer makes his material from, or her material from um, a whole cloth. Um, and I, I knew there were borrowings, but it, when, you, when you begin to compare um, the Emile Gaborio novels side by side with A, a Study in Scarlet, you, you can see actual paragraphs that are almost word for word and things that I'd long assumed were just kind of, you know, pure, pure uh, this is heresy, I know, uh, but <laughs> dangerous heresy. Um, things that I assumed were, were pure Conan Doyle, um, the, the, the most sort of homes of activities turn out to be pretty much borrowed from, from a, um, a Gaborio character called Tabare, uh, who, who does very similar things with mud and ash and, um, and traces left by the, um, by the living on the, on the material world. Um, it's, it's really striking how much he, he borrows. Um, and yes, you know, he brings a different life to it. Um, the, the London of, of the novel, I think, is, is sort of alive in a way that, uh, that few other cities re really are as 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 backdrops, which is a pretty re pretty remarkable feat for somebody who'd never actually really lived in London <laughs> at this point. He'd he'd been to visit a few re a few relatives, um, but he he he, you know, he can kind of learned his London from from books to some extent, as as uh, as, as many people do. Yeah. Oh, oh, Sir Arthur. Um, 
lifting all this stuff. Um, I, I have um, uh, a couple more general questions if we time again, but 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 uh, I think uh, there are specific questions uh, uh, about the particular books that I, I I want to ask each of you individually, if I could. Um, and and Nick, we, we, we'll start with you. And and this is the thing that fascinates me about um, about studying Scarlet is you know what's the deal with the Mormons? Why why the Mormons? Why did he choose Mormons? Is 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 Conan Doyle? alone in this is this is this uh, an innovation of his um uh um, writing about mormons and turning them into into bad guys is he drawing on a tradition of some kind and why just when things are hotting up in london does the novel switch to utah what's what's going on with the mormons what's going on with the mormons yeah no it it, he he definitely does not invent this all by himself and and again it's it's um it's a sign of, of, of just what a great um sort of cultural magpie Arthur Conan Doyle was that he he picks up a lot of this material from other other writers um, and there's a lot of anti-Mormon um, feeling in in late 19th century Britain um, some but to do with fears about polygamy about the recruitment of British women and they're, they're being kind of lured off to to Utah um, some but based on actual you know sort of rather, rather grim episodes there's a um, uh, a massacre, um, the Mountain Meadows massacre, in, in which the the Mormons fell upon a, a wagon trail going 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 west, um, and and that reverberates for for quite quite a few decades through through um, through popular culture. Um, so he's he's picking up on on anti Mormon memoirs. He's picking up on uh, material in people like Mark Twain, actually, um, and and even uh, I think. I figure that I, I hadn't come across until I started doing this this, um, this editing work. Uh, um, a colourful character called William Jarman, who, who seems to have done a sort of edutainment tour of, of the southwest of, of, of England, bringing a sort of um, Mormon roadshow uh, in, in which, dressed in, I, I assume, completely dubious uh, Mormon robes, he described what he what what, what, he, what he termed the um, the mixture of, of incest and polygamy and murder uh, that that he, he saw as the backdrop, or sorry, not backdrop, the the, the, the fabric of um, of, of Mormon society. Um, Jarman was, was probably kind of wandering through um, Bristol and Plymouth around the time that, um, that that Conan Doyle was there. And and Conan Doyle would have seen plays, The Day Nights, which was um, a play that featured the, the strawing angels, sort of a vengeful secret society who... Um, so the, the dark side of Mormon life as uh, as revealed on stage um, in in Victorian melodrama. So he he's picking up on, on a lot of material that that that's there in popular culture. I mean, more more directly, he gets it from Robert Louis Stevenson and Fanny Vandegrift Stevenson's uh, The Dynamiter. But it, there's a lot of it there in in more popular popular culture uh, as 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 well. The, the 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 switch from from London to Utah. Um, again, this is heresy, but I, I actually I, I do think that this, this 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 is Conan Doyle still learning his craft, um, and it, it is not, in fact, uh, I think, the most successful of his interpolated episodes. He's much much better at it in um, the Sign of Four, I think, where we we switch away and we we, we get quite a, quite a gripping story. It's quite a gripping story in this one too. But the switch from first person narration by by Watson to third person narration. Uh, of the Utah episode is actually not entirely successful. I think he he, he again he borrows this. He, he he borrows it as far as I can see from another Gaborio novel, um, uh, the detective um, Lecoq, uh, where the, where there's, there's a similar sort of digression that lasts about forty chapters, and and then we come back to to Paris. Um, so I I, th- I think it was it was one of his less successful borrowings. He, he, he uh, and and yes, you know, right right there at, at the end of the, of the Conan Doyle novels um, in the in, in the Valley of Fear, that there's a very similar sort of um, excursus, um, and we go off again to America uh, and off to the the Scourers uh, this time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, I. I'm not sure it works there either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick! I know. <laughs> oh, heresy. So, so a specific one for Jarlath then, uh, and uh, you know, um, and you, you've sort of alluded to this a little already, but 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 in 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 your introduction to the memoirs, as we move towards the end, as we move towards the final problem, um, you you start giving us a, a picture of Holmes, um, almost as a kind of um, a theological warrior, a kind of holy warrior engaged in a sort of metaphysical quest to root out evil, and uh, you know, M- Moriarty, you can quite 
close to describing him literally as the devil himself. So do you want to tell us a bit more about that? I think what, what struck me was, at first, was this extraordinary moment in the Naval Treaty where, which is an investigation into, into a missing treaty which could cause an international war. And Holmes suddenly turns aside and looks at fl uh, flowers in the garden and starts musing on providence and the nature of providence and uh, how that is the biggest question that detectives need to, to turn their attention to. And it struck me then going back through the stories that there's constant references to evil, the nature of evil. Um, uh, numerous characters refer to, you know, the, as if they're only instruments in, uh, of, a, of a larger power. Uh, Trevor in um, The Glorious Scott says, you know, when he's asked who turned up um, to harass him, he says the devil himself. And I think that by the time we get to um, the final problem, uh, we're, 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 we're seeing Holmes as someone who's interested in the workings of providence, uh, possibly stimulated by the apparent random arbitrary nature of evil in the cardboard box, but he's going to he's going to solve this. He's going to solve this problem and make sure that there isn't arbitrary evil. That in fact the universe does make sense. And in the final problem, he's confronted with um, a man he described as, rep as as reptilian, who has something of the serpentine about him, who is um, the power behind most of the instances of evil and crime that 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 have gone on. You know, almost all that is undetected. So he, uh, he, you know, Moriarty is almost literally here um, some kind of Ophidian um, creature that's come from from uh, you know the, the darkness, crawled out from 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 hell itself, and he's going to be the the Christian warrior who will struggle with him at the end, almost like Jacob struggles with the mysterious figure in the Book of Genesis, and pull him down into the Reichenbach Falls and, and completely exterminate him. The, there's a, in a memorable phrase, I think Moriarty said he's going to crush Holmes under his heel. And that's taken from the book of Genesis, where God says, you know, they, that the, the, the offspring of Eve will crush the serpent under his, under her, his heel. But I think here, it's almost like this is, this is um, Doyle's lapsed Catholicism coming back, um, you know, as, as a kind of, the, 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 there's a residue there of that, that the, the Catholic idea of that, this, what we're dealing with here is that the, the great cosmic battle between good and evil and Holmes by this period, by this time, by the final problem, is very definitely on the side of good. And that's why Watson describes him in that final line as the, the, the best and the wisest man. So he's the best. Um, so he is he's angelic. In the, in the yes, I, I was I was wondering as you were saying this whether you know it, it, is this the um, influence of the Jesuits and Stonyhurst um, that, that, that that we're seeing here. I, I think it's I think it's partly that I don't you know I, how much he believes it, but there's also a, a, a bit of an obsession with the figure of Satan in the in the final decades of the of the the 19th century. Mm. You get obviously the sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli, but you get he, he pops up in other places. You know Oscar Wilde's Fisherman and the and the Soul, Lionel Johnson's The Dark Angel. You know Satan Satan is is a presence in late 19th century uh, popular culture and. I suppose the question here will be to, to what extent we are to, to, to really understand um, this mysterious figure of Moriarty that we never get to, you know, Watson never meets, can only see him in the distance, um, how much we are to read him as a kind of theological enemy of, of uh, Holmes, a Holmes who will die and then rise again. Yeah, um, I, I, I honestly didn't know you were going to bring this up, but here, here's my here's a prop. Uh, here's my copy of Murray Corelli's The Sorrows of Satan from the 1890s, which I happen to have lying around. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and Chris, finally then, um, uh, so, so in in The Return, you give us this picture of um, of, of Holmes operating, well, firstly operating in a, in a, in a rather more violent way world um, uh, that, than we'd seen hitherto. And you spoke earlier on about this, that, 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 that he's more of a man of action. These are more physical stories. Um, but also, um, uh, th uh, that this is a collection in which Watson plays a more significant, more prominent part. So, so tell us a bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking here that there's very much a sense in which to return 
goes back to the slightly more violent atmosphere of those first two novels, The Study in Scarlet and The Sign of Four, where you have you know, Andaman Islanders running around London shooting poisoned blow, <laughs> uh, <laughs> poisoned darts out of blowpipes and, and you know, rooms soaked with blood. By the time Doyle moves to the Strand magazine in short story format in 1891, the, the stories become much more about intrigues rather than about um, murders in that sense. They are a less violent set of stories, the adventures, and to a certain extent, uh, the memoirs. And actually, at one point in the adventures, Watson says, well, actually, your, your last four or five cases haven't dealt with crime at all. They've just been sort of interesting puzzles in that regard. And there are murders in those stories, but they seem to be the exception rather than the rule. And actually, you know, Jolliffe has already mentioned the problem of the cardboard box, which seems out of step with, with the memoirs. But also, the final problem, what makes that story so shocking, is it is the eruption of violence into a Holmesian universe, which, at least in the pages of the Strand magazine, had, hadn't had sort of been kept at bay. Um, the editorial policy of the Strand magazine, it seemed, was to, to desensationalise, or in some of the home stories, to say, well, something sensational like a murder might have happened, but actually that's turned out not to be the case. So in The Man with a Twisted Lip, for instance, we see that logic uh, very much to the fore. By the time we get to the return of Sherlock Holmes, most of those stories are about murder, and not just any old murder, but murder with, with pokers being smashed into heads, with blackmailers being pumped full of lead by angry, <laughs> by angry uh, ladies. Um, we've got uh, secret societies. We've got sort of moral violence in, in Charles Augustus Milverton with... Uh, with the blackmail plot there as well. So there seems to be this, this much more uh, violent realm to these stories. I think it's interesting that in The Empty House, the opening story, that sets the tone for this, this space of London, not as a sort of a rationalised space, but as a kind of an urban jungle. Um, Sebastian Moran in The Empty House is always referred to, is constantly referred to as being the hunter and then he turns into the hunter as well, becomes the tiger. He's a sort of a paradoxical figure who's both hunted uh, and hunter. But there's this, this, this imperial set of references, which again goes back to a study in Scarlet and the, uh, and the Sign of Four, this idea that London is actually uh, a much more dangerous place than it might hitherto have been in the adventures and the, uh, and the memoirs. And I think partially that is to do with maybe a, a change in policy uh, at the Strand magazine as well. Maybe the... Uh, the sensibilities of the Strand in the 1890s have now become slightly loosened, and actually people like Herbert Greeno Smith, the literary editor, are a bit happier to have slightly more violent stories uh, in the pages of the magazine. Regarding um, the second half, so Watson and Watson's sort of increased role there, as I mentioned earlier, there's this very much this sense in which Watson is a slightly more astute character in The Return of Sherlock Holmes. So whereas in earlier stories, Holmes would have made a, an amazing deduction and, and Watson would have said, how do you get that? And then we'd have gone step by step through the unraveling of the, of the clues. Um, in The Return, Holmes can say, you know, he can make a claim about where clients come from. And then Watson will say, oh yes, I recognized the mud on his shoe or I recognized all the bits that Holmes has picked up on. So there's this sense again that Watson has learned. This is partially why you need the Stanley Hopkins character to come in, because I think Doyle realizes, is it slightly realistic to have Watson hanging around with Holmes for decades now and have picked up nothing, uh, to have learned nothing? So Watson is, is, has slightly more agency um, in a story like Charles Augustus Milverton, actually, he he has you know he has a certain amount of agency in the in the story as well. He and Holmes go as equals uh, to Milverton's uh, to Milverton's house. They break in uh, they break in together. Um, likewise, I think what's interesting in the return is the way in which they also foreground Watson not simply as a chronicler of Holmes's adventures, but also as a creator of them as well. There's a very strange moment at the end of the Norwood Builder. Um, where Holmes is not quite sure whether the blood in the woodpile belong. He finds out it, it belongs to an animal, but he says, you know, is it is it a dog or or a rabbit? Um, and the and the, the the guilty party refuses to to you know, say which one it was because in many ways it's an irrelevant detail. And Holmes says at the end of that story, he says to Watson, uh, "Well, if you write this up, you can just say it was rabbits." Uh, just <laughs> just put that in. And that is a really discomforting moment because I think it makes us aware that actually Watson is our only point of entry into this world, at least in, in the 13 stories of the return of Sherlock Holmes. It's a moment, even though Holmes is recommending this, we're also aware that Watson is writing Holmes recommending this 
uh, as well. Watson suddenly, visibly, has much more textual power than I think it, it really happened um, in, in the previous home stories up until that point. So, yeah, Watson becomes a, a much more uh, agential uh, figure. He has yep. much more uh, agency, I think, in these stories than maybe in previous ones. Yeah. Um, so I could, I could go on all day, and there's so many more things um, that I want to ask, but also that I want to talk about. Um, but I, I'm, I'm also aware that there, we, that there, there is um, a spectral audience out there um, in virtual audience land, um, uh, 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 who I hope um, uh, have questions of of their own. And um, so we've been we've been rabbiting on for forty five minutes, uh, or possibly dogging on for forty five minutes, I, depending on on whether you believe Watson or not. Um, uh, so, so I think it's it's time for um, uh, uh, some questions from from the audience, if there are any. Yes, there are. Um, I will go through these in no particular order um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time that we've got left. If we don't get to your question, I do apologise. Um, so the first one that we have coming in from Matt is, what is the best reading order of the full Sherlock Holmes canon, especially for anyone who's new to it? Do we begin at the beginning? Uh, is that is that the question? Do we do we do we begin with uh, uh, as as studying in in Scarlet? Um, I mean, that would be that would be my sense of it. Um, uh, that, that 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 we absolutely should, um, because then we get to see uh, Watson coming back from the Afghan wars, and we get to see the 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 the, the, the first meeting of Holmes and Watson. But I, you know, I think that, that there's a good argument for starting with the adventures, as well as the moment where Holmes really goes stratospheric. I, I don't know what we think. Is, is Matt wondering whether you should try to address them in chronological, in, in terms oh, in of an actual of, chronology, in this chronological order to go back to Gloria Scott and the Musgrave and start moving up that way um, and follow, yeah, I, I, you know, editors keep on trying to construct Holmes chronologies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are many competing ones. I think you'd, you'd probably, it would be very difficult because there's so many disagreements about how the story should follow one on another. Um, I suppose you could start with Gloria Scott and, 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 and Musgrave, but I, I wouldn't recommend it, certainly. I think that the best thing is to do is start with Scarlet and then move up. But I don't know what other people think. Well, Nick, you're, you're on the ground floor again with Scarlet. So would you start there? I, I'm torn between, you know, Macri, my own wares, as it were, and uh, I'm suggesting that if somebody hasn't read any of the of the of the Holmes canon, that they might want to start with with a you know a, a, a smaller sample and maybe read one of the the adventures first. Um, and you know, if if you like the adventures, then you know, go back and and start reading the whole lot because you're probably going to like everything. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, you you couldn't do worse really, or couldn't couldn't do better as, than than start with the redheaded league. I think in many ways, um, terrific story, and um, you know, it's 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 just perfect, really. I think, Chris. Uh, no, I'm I'm actually in agreement. I think the two ways you can do it: either start chronologically with study or or with the adventures, as I think one of the sort of the, the key starting points. I think those are the two uh, the two options. I suppose there's possibly a case as well for starting with Hand of the Baskervilles as maybe the most successful, I think, of the standalone novels. Um, that might be a contentious claim, I don't know. But um, but yeah, I, I, I certainly, I, I either start with a study in Scotland if you want to work chronologically, or with the adventures as I think the best sort of standalone uh, mm. entry into the Holmesian universe. Okay. Any more questions? Great, thank you. Yeah, we have another one. How much of our impression of Holmes is coloured by Watson as the unreliable narrator? So, Chris, you already started on this one, didn't you? So do you want to finish your thoughts on this one? Um, yeah, so it's 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 interesting. Um, I, I would say that on, on one level, all of our image of Holmes comes from Watson as this uh, this unreliable narrator. And actually, when I when I teach the Holmes stories, students are always pointing out the way in which Holmes is is presented. We've spoken about Holmes as being this superheroic figure, but actually, what my students always pick up on is the fact that he's hero he's heroic in the eyes of Watson. He's constructed as a hero in in the eyes of Watson. So I think Watson's um, Watson's status as narrator is absolutely crucial in producing this figure uh, of Holmes. Now, 
the slight fly in the ointment there is actually there are a couple of stories which aren't narrated by Watson. Actually, there are I think there are the three stories which aren't narrated by Watson. One of which is also narrated by Holmes himself, which isn't the best story because in many ways, it you know, you, you can't quite have detective fiction narrated by the detective because um, you have to hold something back, and and that story has to sort of jump through various hoops in sort of keeping the mystery. Uh, the mystery back a bit, um, but yeah, I'd say absolutely. Watson's um, Watson's position is is absolutely crucial. I've always argued actually that there are two Watsons in in the home stories. You've got the Watson who's actually in the action as it happens, but then you've got the other Watson, the Watson who's narrating, and the Watson who actually knows a lot more than Holmes because he's lived through it. He's actually narrating this from a, uh, a posterior. Uh, perspective, and sometimes you see flashes of that other Watson um, coming through. So I find Watson, you know, a, a fascinating uh, figure now. Technologically, I, I I bristle a bit when he's described as a sort of idiotic figure, because in many ways he's also sort of creating that. He's also being strategic in in that regard. So yeah, Watson is absolutely a uh, fascinating figure in that regard. Yeah, I mean that that that's my sense also that that that, that all of the evocative language uh, about Dartmoor, for example, in 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 Hound of the Baskervilles, um, uh, that's all Watson because because Holmes, as I was saying earlier, is absent from much of the novel. So Watson really carries that novel, um, and you know, and if it is the most achieved of uh, of the long Sherlock Holmes stories, and I think it certainly is, um, it's it's very significantly uh, uh, Watson's doing. I think. Um, any further thoughts on this? Okay, we'll move on to the next question then. Yes, we have time for probably one more. Um, so what role has Arthur Conan Doyle had on British cultural heritage? Ooh. Um, well, I mean, for, for, for me, um, uh, Conan Doyle is the great British genre writer. Um, uh, and, um, you know, so he, he creates the landmark detective. Um, uh, there's the Professor Challenger stories. He writes gothic tales. He writes horror stories. He writes uh, nautical adventures. He writes historical fiction. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, he, he's, a, uh, he's a genuinely great and inspired, I think, genre writer. Uh, and, and, and so I think his, his cultural influence is, is massive, um, um, as 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 a consequence, um, it's it's actually for me it's quite difficult to imagine the history of twentieth century popular fiction um, uh, and the 20th, maybe even the twentieth century novel without uh, without Conan Doyle um, uh, and and you know his influence. All sorts of people read um, read Conan Doyle, read Sherlock Holmes. So he turns up, you know, he's. Uh, uh, directly quoted um, in in um, in, in T.S. Eliot's poetry, for example, um, in the Four Quartets, uh, there's, there's there's this allusion to the to the great Grimp and Maya, um, uh, and and and, and Baskerville. So so he, I think his I think his cultural influence is enormous. Gentlemen, uh, I th I think it's hard to imagine twentieth century English identity without noticing Holmes walking around the kind of psychic landscape of. Uh, the English mind. So I think, you know, if if you were to to put together a, a host of literary characters that, not just sort of populated popular culture, but actually constructed the way England thinks of itself, I think, uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories are you know front and center here. It's it's part of the reason. It, you know, if, if I think Nick referred to this, if he's a superhero, he's England's, he's England's superhero. Um, America has a load of them. There, 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 there's a couple of hundred superheroes, but England has a superhero who has died and come back to life, and is therefore, uh, you know, he can't, he can't be destroyed. So I think that, you know, in that alone, he's he's contributed to a sort of cultural history. He's he's there. He's 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 impossible to to repress. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. And I, you probably have to wait till James Bond to find a, a British literary figure who has the same sort of influence, really, um, on the way in which people see themselves, see London, see England, really. Um, it's just hard to fathom. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. There's, I, I'm in complete agreement, actually, about yeah, the, the centrality of, of Conan Doyle to English. And also... Um, British literature as well. Doyle himself is this weird sort of composite English-Scottish 
Uh, and Irish? A sense of, and Irish as well, yeah. Actually, we were speaking about Doyle quotations. Of, um, there's a reference to Sherlock Holmesing in Ulysses uh, as well, of course. Is that, that another sort of literary uh, reference? But obviously, you know, Holmes pops up absolutely everywhere. He's become this absolute image of, of Britishness. Um, even the, the silhouette is, instinct, is in, you know, instinctively recognisable. And I think it's striking that... Um, you know, he's not only bound up, you know, Doyle's work is not only bound up with the literary, but also with filmic adaptations as well, you know, television adaptations. And actually, Doyle is, is really interested in those. I'm, I'm thinking back to when he's promoting The Lost World and his fake film of, of footage of dinosaurs that he supposedly uh, discovered and shows to audiences around America. You know, he's very sort of technologically advanced as well he'd, he'd be absolutely sort of you know a, a key social media figure i think if he were alive today yeah uh, and, and this is extraordinary um you know for um somebody whose you know angle of approach to to england and englishness is so oblique you know he he is uh he's a catholic scottish irish writer um uh, um so so this is pretty far from um, being at the at the at the at the centre of a of, of any kind of establishment, uh, and and so I think this is one of the reasons that makes his take um, on 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 England and Englishness, Britain and Britishness, and the identities of these islands more generally, and the empire, which is something we didn't really have time to talk about, but is very much there in his writing, uh, is what makes him such an interesting writer, um, I think. Um, so I think we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. Uh, I, I don't know whether Luciana is going to make a, a, a dramatic appearance again to round us off. I wasn't planning to. <laughs> Apart from to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those questions. They're, they're lots of fascinating questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but thank you to all of you for joining us this evening and everybody on the chat please do look out for our other Sherlock Holmes books and look out for other events that will be coming up from OUP in the future thank you thank you very much everybody and thanks to our our, our wonderful editors this evening and good night thanks Dan and good night thank you bye thanks, everybody bye, bye.